say good morning. I have been given the privilege to lead us in prayer. As always, I ask that you pray with me. Let us pray. Most righteous and eternal Father, we come before thy throne acknowledging that you are our creator. Most of all, Father, we come with humble hearts asking you to forgive us for any sin that we may have committed against thy throne. We ask that our slates be wiped clean at this time. Father God, with thanksgiving upon our lips and gratitude in our hearts, Father, we just come thanking you for the many of blessings which you have bestowed upon us from our earliest existence until this present time. Father God, we truly thank you for your darling son, Jesus, who came and died on Calvary on our behalf. We pray, Father, that thy will be done. Father God, we ask the blessings be upon us all. We ask the blessings upon the sick, the shut-in, those that are bereaved, first those that are in the household of faith. Father God, we ask the blessings be upon the one who will come before us shortly and break on to us another portion of your heavenly divine word. We ask that you anoint, anoint his head, Father, with the knowledge and the wisdom, whereby he may be able to break that word unto us in simplicity. And we ask, as hearers of that word, that we be attentive, and not just hearers, dear God, but we ask that we be doers of that word. We ask that you bless all of those 
who are in attendance. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Let us all say, Amen. This life is filled with sorrow and troubles here below. We ought to make to wonder just why it should be so. In every tribulation, this life must reign. We're singing, oh Lord, we need, we need a friend like you.
Sunday morning worship, and we're just thankful, so thankful that you joined us and you decided to tune in and worship with us this Lord's Day. We, we know that things are not like we like, but we have to do what we can with what we got. We thank you so much for tuning in, and we pray that you will be enlightened and that you will be encouraged uh, by our service today and by the thought from the Word of God. If you would, repeat after me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us, let us, let us exalt his name together. Amen. We, we want to lift up the mighty name of Jesus and exalt God, our Father in heaven. This morning, passage chosen for our consideration comes from the book of Revelation, 
chapter is one, and we will focus our attention on verses four through six. And if you go there, you will find these words. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This morning I want to talk to you about glory to God for his grace. Glory to God for his grace. Now, in this passage, John is writing to Christians who are facing severe persecution for their faith in Jesus. He's writing to Christians facing imprisonment, death, temptation, and trials not because they're bad people, not because they've broken any laws, not because they're criminals, but only because they believe in Jesus. He's writing to Christians who are being pressured to abandon their faith and compromise their faith. How can these Christians overcome? How can they persevere? In his, in his greeting, he sends grace and peace to them from him who is, who was, and who is to come. He sends grace and peace to them from the seven spirits before his throne. And he sends grace and peace to them from Jesus the Christ. Their deliverance can only come from the grace extended by these three, the grace that they receive. Now, Grace is different than justice. Justice is getting what we deserve. Grace is different than mercy because mercy is receiving that good that we don't deserve. But grace is getting good that we don't deserve in spite of how bad we really are. Somebody wrote amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I already come. T'was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. You know, confidence comes when you know that God is gracious. And we ought to be thankful to God and give glory to God that he extended his grace to us and saved us from our sinful condition. Now, you know, if you ask most Christians, they're not sure they're going to be saved in the end. You'll hear folks say, I hope so, or the Lord willing. But Paul tells us, that it is by his grace that we are saved. Ephesians chapter two, verses one through nine read, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. He had made us alive who once was dead. Where in time past, ye walk according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, it used to rule us, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature 
the children of wrath, even as others. Paul is telling the Ephesians that you too used to be like them. You too used to be led by the lust of the desires of your flesh and of your mind. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace, verse eight, are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved because of God's grace. Not too long, we've looked at salvation as a point system. If you do enough good works, you'll be saved. If I baptize a lot of people, I'll be saved. If I don't miss the assembly when we were gathering together in person, then I'll be saved. If I make every Bible class, or if I pass out tracts, or if I do good to my fellow man, I'll be saved. Or if I don't cuss, or if I don't sleep around, or if I try to do good for, or if I try to read my Bible and help somebody else, then I'll be saved. We've been conditioned that we have to send up some timber every day so there'll be a home for us in glory. Too many have misunderstood the scriptures to believe that if you don't work, you won't be saved. You know, they say stuff like, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You got to have some labor. Your works will follow you. You got to have some works. Work out your own salvation, et cetera, et cetera. They use these to try to make us think that we can earn our way into heaven. But God says we are saved by his grace. And Paul said, not of works lest any man should boast. I've heard people shame others because they haven't brought anybody to Christ. I've heard people shame others because they have not grown in Christ. But Paul says, this thing is not by works. You don't get to brag. You get to say glory to God because he's gracious to me. We're saved by grace. If you believe salvation is obtained by works, then you got the cart before the horse. See, Paul said, we are saved by grace. The gift of God is salvation to those who believe on his son, Jesus. So I don't have, I don't live right to be saved. I live right because I'm saved. I don't love my neighbor to be saved. I love my neighbor because I'm saved. I forgive those who harm me because I'm saved. I help those who need a hand because I'm saved. I, if I lend a hand in ministry. I pray for the lost. I pray for the found. I let my light shine before men because I'm saved. What I am is a, I'm a billboard for salvation. Jesus said that when men see your good works, they'll glorify the Father, not you. My life should be an example of somebody who's received the benefit of the grace of God. This is not a competition. It's not how many Bible classes have you taught. It's how are you living because you are Say, his grace is more powerful than my sin. Because in Paul's dilemma, in his thorn in the flesh period, you know it, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee. He reminds us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He knew who we were. He knew how we would act. He knew how we would treat and mistreat others. He knew how we would live. 
He knew what words would come out of our mouths. He knew we could be sneaky. He knew we would be mean. He knew all of this beforehand, but he still died for us. He did it because it was grace that brought salvation, not good works. My good works are a result of him saving me. Jesus says, I want you to love everybody because this is how folk going to know that you're my disciples. If you have love one for another, not this is how you're going to become my disciple. This is how folk going to know. Church, we've got the grace of God. He's already saved us. Now it's incumbent upon us to show forth the grace that God has already manifested in our lives. And if we believe the Bible, that salvation is a gift to God, gift of God, it's because he's gracious unto us. Now, this does not give you free reign to disobey his commands or misrepresent his teachings or ignore his instructions and act like those that don't belong to him. But what it does tells me is that God knows when I'm trying. God sees how I have used the grace that he has extended to me. Did I take it and lock it up and hide it in the closet and keep it to myself or am I showing somebody else? That I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Am I living a life? that honors God. We ought to give God some glory for his grace because that's what saved me. God knows when the walls close in around me. He knows when I'm overwhelmed. He knows when I'm trying. He knows that I'm relying on his grace to see me through. He's been gracious to us throughout this pandemic and many don't even see it. He's kept us above water, even though turbulent waters. He has kept our head above water. He has kept us alive, kept us moving forward, kept us when we didn't think we were going to make it. And we ought to give God some glory for his grace. It's important for us to know about this thing called grace. Paul talks a lot about grace to the Romans. He mentions grace 25 times to the Corinthians. He mentions it 21 times to the Galatians, seven times to the Ephesians. He mentions it 12 times. He mentions the grace of God, the grace of Jesus, the riches of his grace, sufficient grace, exceeding grace, abounding grace, being called by grace, falling from grace. We might have grace obtain grace, be strong in grace, minister grace, and speak with grace. God has saved us by his grace, and the Bible is telling us that we ought to give God some glory because of his grace. To the sinner, he extends his grace by allowing the pardon of sins by the death of his son, Jesus. To the saints, he extends his grace continually by giving the guidance of the Holy Spirit and assurance of his promises. We can never earn what we've received. We can never stand before him on our own. The love of God is something we could never understand. I heard a man say one time, I can't sin too bad for God to stop loving me. And I can't do too much good to make him love me anymore. He's already loved me from the beginning. How else can an all-knowing God love a fallible creature like man? How else can he look beyond our faults and supply our needs over and over again? How could he make and keep such wonderful promises to us when we break promise to him all the time. It's because he is gracious. How can the blood of Jesus pay for all of my sins and all of your sins and all the sins they ever committed from the beginning of time? How can he keep picking me up when I fall down constantly? 
How can he continue to care for me even when sometimes I act like I don't care for him? It's because he's gracious. His grace has been extended to me and is now available for you to enjoy as well. Time after time in scripture, we read of writers extending grace and peace to the readers. And there's a, there's a wonderful, wonderful story of grace found in the book of Luke. I mean, the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth. And I, I encourage you, as a matter of fact, I, 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 I assign you to read the book of Ruth in your leisure and, 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 and find this story of Ruth. There's a man named Elimelech. He lived in Bethlehem because there was a famine in the land. And he, he goes to Moab and he finds his wife named Naomi. Then he dies. He left Naomi with her two sons. And these sons get wives of the Moabites, uh, one named Orpah and one named Ruth. Then the sons die. They leave the mother and the two wives alone. Now, Naomi said, look, I'm going back to Bethlehem and I want you girls to just go on and find you another husband because you can't, you can't go with me. And in chapter one, verse number 16, and Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. Jehovah, do so to me and more also, if all but death depart thee and me. So Ruth says, Naomi, you going back to Bethlehem? I'm going back with you. Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem, and they're struggling. They're poor. They don't have a man to take care of them. They don't have a husband or a, a, a father to protect them. And they run upon one of the one of the relatives, near kinsmen of Elimelech named Boaz. And when Boaz saw Ruth, he told his reapers to treat her kindly and watch out for her. He fed her, gave her water, told the men not to touch her. Matter of fact, he even told them while you're gleaning in the fields, drop a little bit of grain for Ruth to gather. She's now under the wings of the Lord God of Israel, enjoying his grace. So then later on, Boaz decides, I'm going to exercise the right of a near kinsman, and I'm going to take you as wife. Now, this is an interesting book because it contains no conquests or famous battles. It doesn't focus on the prophets the judges or the kings in Israel. It's not about disobedient Israel or hard-hearted Judah. There are no miracles, no wanderings, no power struggle or sins. There's no jealousy or intrigue or hatred or dissension. This book is about grace. The chapter ends telling us that Boaz descended from Perez, who descended from Judah. From Boaz comes Obed, and from Obed comes Jesse. From Jesse comes David, king of Israel. And later down the line comes Joseph, husband of Mary and mother of Jesus. And, and when, you look, when you look at the text, when you look at the scriptures, you see 14 generations occurred between Abraham and David. 14 generations between David and the Babylonian captivity. 14 generations between Babylon and Jesus. 42 generations in total. And we see grace extended through the entire time. 42 generations between the promise and that he that was promised. 42 generations between the covenant and the completion of the covenant. 42 generations between the mention and the Messiah, between the call and the comforter, between the conversation and the Christ. 42 generations between hope to come and the hope that has come. I'm glad the scripture decided to tell us this story about grace. In Revelation, John speaks of grace and peace for us and glory and power forever for God. 
We ought to give God glory for the grace that he has given us. You know you don't already sinned enough to go to hell, but God has been gracious unto you. Paul said we were dead in sin, and he quickened us. He made us alive. Because of all that we have, he's, glory, he's gracious to us. We ought to give glory to God for his grace. We have the grace of God because Jesus died for our sins. We have the grace of God through the promise of eternal salvation. We have the grace of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have the grace of God through the forgiveness of our sins. We have the grace of God through his continuous presence, his matchless provisions, his glorious promises, and his sufficient protection. And because we have all that from God, we ought to give back to God what he deserves. All the glory belongs to him. Because he's mighty, he deserves glory. Because he's holy, he deserves glory. Because he saved me, he deserves glory. Because he's worthy, he deserves glory. He's undefeated. He's unmatched. He's God and there ain't nobody like him. He's righteous. He's just. He's kind and a compassionate friend. We ought to give glory to God for all of his grace. He's extended his grace to us by allowing us to partake of the gift of his son, Jesus. By grace, we are saved. Somebody out there this morning needs to be saved. Somebody needs to know about the risen Savior. Somebody needs to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. If you want to be saved, want to be saved right now, give us a call. Our number's on the screen. We'll make arrangements to, to meet you and to baptize you for the forgiveness of your sin. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And for those of us who are saved, we ought to give glory to God for his grace. Thank you, God, for loving me more than I could ever deserve. Thank you for the gift that you've given me. How can you love me so much to let your son die for me? Me, little old no good me. But you did. And because you did, I thank you. We thank God that he has been gracious to us. If you need prayer, Give us a call. We'll go to God in prayer on your behalf. We thank you this morning for listening. We pray that you will always remember that we are saved by grace. As always, I want to ask you to continue to be careful and be prayerful. God bless you.
come to the part of our service, which is the communion. We take it to remember the sacrifice that was made for us on Calvary. In Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse number 26 through 28, we find, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Let us go to God on behalf of the bread and the cup. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for blessing us to have a Savior who died for our sins. We pray, Father, that you would please bless this bread and this cup and all those who partake of it, that we will do it in a way that will be pleasing in thy sight. Thank you for Jesus and thank you for what he's done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may now take the bread. And now the cup. Or you can put it in the mailbox and we will make sure that you will be credited uh, with your contribution. We know that God loves us. and We know that God has provided for us. And we thank God and honor him with our substance. Let us pray now for our collection. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the bounty which we have received from you. We thank you, Lord, for whatever way we make a living and we pray, Father, that the gifts that we give back to you will be found pleasing before thee. Father, we pray that you will bless those who administer these funds to do so in a way that will be pleasing in your sight for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. She's the Vice President of the United States, and she looks just like you. <laughs> wow. There are heroes that have lived it yeah. with the courage oh, yeah. Black heroes yeah, yeah. There are heroes that have lived it uh -huh. with the courage So often untold Opening doors that once had been held Overlooked in the histories of men They make me hard But 
Praise to the Father, praise to my mama Praise to the ancestors, to all the fallen This for the struggle, this for the calling This for the brothers and the sisters of tomorrow We gotta love each other, problems we can solve them We gotta love each other, problems we can solve them We are heroes that have lived it With the courage Of men. 